OK, uh, recording has started. Over to you, Tanya. That's great, Brian. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction um, and thank you for the opportunity to talk uh, tonight as well. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Tanya Galliara. Uh, as, Bri as Brian's very kindly introduced me, um, I work within the operations team at East West Railway Company. Um, my, I specialise in operational systems integration. I'll apologise in advance for any background noise, as per the usual with uh, being on a Teams call. Um, I have visitors at home. I also have two very lively dogs. So please bear with me if there is any background noise. And I apologise in advance. Um, if I could ask that you put any questions in the chat bar, um, and I'll pick them up at the end. Uh, I have my colleague Geordie with me this evening, um, and we'll be looking to do a Q&A after the presentation. So thank you very much. So um, hopefully those of you that have joined the call, you have at least heard of the East West Rail project, but just by way of background, um, it's um, a new, uh, I should, shouldn't say new, it's three years old roughly now, uh, but it's a new railway link uh, looking at connecting the uh, communities in the Oxford to Cambridge arc, so east, uh, east to west. Uh, some of you may be aware that there was originally a railway line uh, previously between Oxford and Cambridge, which uh, was decommissioned and we're now looking at the best way to reinstate that link. Um, it's building on work uh, that was already started by Network Rail, who are currently looking at what's now called Connection Stage 1, but was previously known as Western Section Upgrade, and we'll be looking at that in, in a little bit more detail later on the presentation. Um, as you can see from the slide here, uh, we're looking at extending out um, to provide links between existing stations and also there will be some new stations as well, uh, such as Winslow. Uh, but as you can see, because of the, the fact that it goes across several different network rail regions, we're going to be interacting with many different existing passenger services, both rail, bus and otherwise. Um, and of course, interacting with several different communities um, across that region as well. So why why rebuild this uh, connection, um, given that um, you know the, the previous line had been decommissioned? So the case has been put forward that um, it's really about investing in the local community, promoting economic prosperity um, across the arc. Um, and the National Infrastructure Commission, um, uh, in particular, um, in one of the reports that they did, found that um, unless this work was done, um, future progression of the region would be hindered uh, by the lack of connectivity and the lack of appropriate housing. Um, as an example, uh, we've got the diagram there, which just um, indicates the current connectivity times with the existing modes of transport. Some of you may be familiar that there is the X5 coach service that currently serves between Oxford and Cambridge. That can take up to about four hours to connect the two locations. And we're looking at potentially halving that by uh, with the new railway link. So the programme has been um, on the cards for a number of years, or in development now for a number of years. The initial um, NIC report was published in 2017, which promoted the case for carrying out the work. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, Network Rail were commissioned to do an early part of the work looking at, particularly out towards um, Bister Village and, uh, and that Bletchley connection. Um, in, in 2019, the DFT um, commissioned um, EWR as um, a National Strategic Infrastructure Partner. Geordie, I hope I got that acronym correct. Um, so we're, we're effectively an arm's length representative of the DFT to bring the whole programme, Oxford to Cambridge, into fruition. Uh, and therefore, we've now got that sort of support uh, from, the, from the government to uh, implement that work. Um, in the recent uh, sort of spending reviews, 
uh, we we've been granted that initial funding uh, to uh, get that piece of work underway. The sort of key reasons really for again, why do we want to invest in a new railway? Um, it's really about the people in the local communities. Um, it's about that connectivity, um, improving the, the lives on the, of the people on the ground. I used to live in Cranfield, which is um, on, on a section of the route. And while I was living there, um, having moved out and used, being used to living in London, where it was easy to jump on a bus, easy to jump on the tube to get where I wanted to go, and then having to transition to being completely reliant on using a car was quite a sea change for me. Um, I, at the time, I actually turned down a job offer in Cambridge because I didn't want to do the, the drive to Cambridge every day. Um, so, as you can see, if, they, if the railway connection had been there, it would have made, um, instead of me moving away from the local area to find a job, I would have probably stayed in the local area and be living and contributing um, to the success of the local area that I lived in. Additionally uh, to that, um, we recognise that local authorities have done quite a lot of studies and work um, and they, there's a recognition that there is going to be population growth in the region um, and therefore a new railway line will support that population growth um, and also um, support the case for new housing um, in the ARC as well. Beyond that as well, uh, some of the work that we've done as a company have, it has indicated that um, there's, it'd be a lot easier for people to start uh, and grow their own businesses local to the region as well, which encourages growth and prosperity in the area as well. Um, and it's again just thinking about how um, people's lives have changed over the last couple of years. People are moving away from the traditional um, approaches and ideas of ways of working and thinking about new ways of working, particularly uh, given recent circumstances as well. Um, and so we're really about thinking, how do we uh, get people to sort of invest and support their local communities? So just, in the next couple of slides, I'm just going to talk a, a little bit more about some of those opportunities um, and uh, how, how those will grow as well. So really one of the guiding lights for the programme is that we're putting the customer at the heart of what we're doing. Um, in all of the conversations uh, that I have on a daily basis is, and so what benefits is this specific piece of work going to do for my customer, for the passenger? Um, and that's one of the interesting things that I find particularly about my role at the company. Um, because it, one of the things that I really enjoy about my role is that we're really thinking about the operational railway from the start. It's not the afterthought to um, an infrastructure project, we're really thinking about how we can operate this way with the customer in mind um, and making sure that they're, they're at the front, forefront of what we're trying to do. We do want to challenge um, the existing way that projects are de delivered in the railway industry. Uh, we want to be innovative. We want to be challenging the existing ways of working but we're also very conscious um, that we're, it, it is the railway industry is a regulated industry, uh, and therefore we want need to make sure that we're not challenging for the sake of challenging, that we're making sure that um, our, the, the appropriate safety authorities are involved, um, and actually wanting to get those safety authorities and other stakeholders involved as early as possible in the conversation. We recognise that innovation can't happen unless all the stakeholders are involved as early as possible. There's no point coming up with a fantastic design and presenting it and expecting it to be approved and then the project being delayed uh, because people just weren't aware of what we were doing. So we really want to be engaging with all of the stakeholders as soon as possible, um, particularly where we're trying to think of innovative ways to deliver the programme. One really important aspect of the, oh, sorry, one really important aspect of that for us um, is around our commitment to um, sort of environmental considerations, uh, and I think we're all aware 
of the current conversations in government about net net zero carbon um, and the sort of positive move to encouraging people onto public transport and uh, other net zero carbon methods of transport as well. Um, so we're strongly um, of, of, you know, looking to sort of uh, in the work that we're doing, in the infrastructure that we're delivering, we want to leave a positive impact with regards to biodiversity. We want to make sure that we're delivering the programme in as much as possible a net zero carbon manner. Uh, but we also recognise um, it's not just the conventional approaches of um, a di the sort of nat natural environment diversity um, and uh, sort of the traditional perhaps recycle reuse sorts of views. We, you know, that we understand, we appreciate uh, the conversations around mitigating noise as an example, both during the construction program but also during the live operations as well. Um, and that's something that's often been a common theme that I've seen on the rail programmes as well. We don't want to um, disturb existing, uh, we want to minimise the impact on existing uh, land um, and we want to integrate as far as possible with local landowners and stakeholders as well. So we want to be having the positive uh, conversations and engagements um, with landowners, landowners and land stakeholders as well in, in the region of the, of the new line. We are, as part of that, we are also looking as to how um, EWR can support freight. And I think it's just important to just emphasise for a minute here that um, the remit of EWR Co um, is specifically to look at improving passenger um transportation and we are sort of looking at maintaining the existing freight um uh, tr uh provision that's that's currently there but we are also going to be looking to um you know how we can support that further so we are current currently doing some work in that arena at the moment uh this bit this particular one um is a really interesting one for me that's that's part of my job description it's really about integration with other major projects um in in the area but also other external stakeholders as well so it, with with respect to this it's really about making sure that we're not whatever we're doing we're not doing it in isolation uh that we take that we're cognizant of other work that's happening in the region as an example, um, existing work that's taking place at Oxford Station, um, looking at work that's happening uh, with other highways programmes in the region, thinking about things like accessible accessibility and active transport modes, thinking about actually if we're going to be proposing new stations, how is this going to benefit uh, the proposed um, local housing growth? in the region as well. So we're very aware and very conscious of making sure that this project isn't happening in isolation, that we're aware of and connecting with other programmes that are going to be, bring a positive uh, impact to the region as well. Um, not just in terms of the overall benefit, but actually how it, they're delivered as well. Um, you know, we appreciate that if we've got several utilities, highways, rail projects happening in the same region at the same time, there's going to be an awful lot of disruption to the local communities. Um, we're looking at ways of how to improve that and how to sequence some of the work that we're doing as well. So this leads me on to um, this next section, which is really about our role as EWR company, the integrator. And I should just maybe take a moment here just to highlight that um, just in case people weren't aware, there is uh, the EWR East West Rail Alliance, which is currently responsible for building the western section of the route. And there's also EWR Company, which is uh, who I'm representing tonight. Um, and EWR Co, we really much see ourselves as the integrator of several different individual projects that are happening to bring the whole line together. And as really as really part of that, I think this this slide just reflects our values, um, our, our purpose as an organisation, 
and the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. Um, you know, we're very much encouraged that these are not, you know, these are not just words that we have to um, are stating. We very much try and embed these in the day-to-day -day work that we're delivering. Um, so, for example, uh, the work around our customer concept um, and the customer being, being customer being at the forefront um, of every decision that we make. Um, we always come back to purpose, which is to look at the fact that this program should be looking at improving um, the lives in the local community. Um, and I just wanted to focus a little bit specifically on our outcomes. So um, really, uh, these are the sort of key things that we're holding ourselves to um, in terms of delivering um, the project and some of the decisions that we're making as well. Um, and so I'll be talking about these a little bit in the context of the next couple of slides as well. In support of um, the outcomes that we want to achieve, we're taking what's called an enterprise approach. And it's about having that holistic view about how every piece of the EWR program fits together and delivers our outcomes and supports our purpose. In support of this um, enterprise approach, we're going to be working with several organisations to help us deliver this. And in terms of uh, the context of our role as integrator, that's really where we fit in. We're bringing together several organisations to help deliver the holistic railway. The first one I wanted to talk about was the enterprise partner. Um, and the enterprise partner is um, going to be a long term strategic partner that EWR are going to work with. They're going to be onboarded in 2022 um, and looking at the um, integration of the programme through design, delivery and into life service and operations. Um, and so we'll, we, you know, they'll have a lot of technical expertise, particularly in the operations sphere of things um, and helping us transition the programme into that live delivery, uh, sorry, live operations. Support, there are going to be a several other partners uh, there to support the enterprise partner as well. Um, collectively, they're grouped together as um, our delivery phase partners, the DPPs, uh, but they include our technical partner who's going to be responsible for uh, pr preliminary design, um, our program partner who's going to be helping with the management um, and some technical expertise to deliver the whole program through construction, our land and property partner who's going to be helping with the land acquis acquisition piece and management, um, our commercial partner and also our legal partner. Those different partner organisations are going to be supporting us in the delivery of the programme in three different connection stages. So the first one is connection stage, connection stage one, uh, which is the Oxford through to Bletchley and Milton Keynes. This phase um, used to be known as the Western Section project, so some of you may have heard about it as that, and this was this was the phase of the project that had been originally granted to Network Rail before East West Rail Company came on board. Um, and we're currently going through uh, a process of work uh, to apply for um, uh, developed consent order. Um, Geordie, hopefully I got that right. DCO uh, for the Oxford to Cambridge section. And that work is going to be split in two connection stages. Firstly, um, the extension of services from Oxford through to Bedford and then from Oxford all the way through to Cambridge. And the reason why those have been split like that is primarily um, some of you may recognise that um, the Milton Keynes through Bedford section is what's currently known as the Marston Valley Line period where we've got existing um, services provided and there's going to be a, a stage of upgrade and work required to bring that up piece of infrastructure up to speed. We're also looking at potentially some new stations um, in that section as well. And then once we're, we've got that 
piece working we're also looking at then extending that out to Cambridge uh, as well um, and we currently have three delivery teams uh, running to support each of those phases at the moment. So customers and operations so this is the bit where I spend most of my uh, day job um, at the moment. Um, so some of my colleagues in the customer teams have been spending some time trying to understand um, the sort of customer profiles that we have uh, that we'll be using the railway. Apologies, I'm just keeping a quick eye on the time. I've got a few more slides to go through. Um, and as you can see here, we've come up with this initial range of customer personas here um, that are giving us, obviously, we've, we've tried to be as broad as possible with these, but these are giving us a flavour for the types of users that will potentially use the East West Rail line. Um, within this team, we're also looking at how we integrate the infrastructure and the train services. So the potential for, and I'm not saying we do, we're definitely going to do it, but potentially doing vertical integration of some parts of the route um, to improve the service provision that we can give to customers. Um, and that, um, so we're just exploring how that could potentially work at the moment. And again, what my team are also doing are looking at, in particular, first and last mile um, journeys across, across the arc, and again, how we can facilitate and improve that, particularly um, on the MVL stretch for connection stage two, where we there are potential going to be changes to the number of stations available. We also know that we also know that that particular stretch is going to have quite a bit of population growth and housing growth as well. So we have to be mindful not not just of the situation as it is today, but also of the future as it's going to come over the next 10, 15 years as well, and how people's journeys will change um, alongside that as well. Um, and so really the key conclusion that, that I want you to take away from that is that we're really trying to get a good understanding um, of what our customer wants from the railway, how they anticipate using the railway um, and what sort of information that they need. Um, that influences um, how we potentially staff our stations, um, looking at alternative ways to ticketing um, solutions for the station about you know different ways of how people buy their tickets to travel on the station do we even actually need tickets like can we go more on a page go type basis all that sort of that's what we're trying to bring together so that we can um, propose the best possible solution rather than do bits of rework as we go along part of that um, also we're looking at developing what we're calling station personas and what that really means is that um, it's changing the way that we're looking at the stations because the uh, and how um, in relation to how customers will interact with them uh, as they engage on the route so we know that certain stations which are major hubs are going to be ambassador stations and therefore um, you know how, but how they're laid out, the potential staffing arrangements, et cetera, could be very different to maybe say um, uh, a smaller station, which is going to be quite vital for the local community it serves, but actually potentially it could also provide alternative uh, facilities for that local community. So it could be that there might be meeting rooms for that local station as well. Just as an example um, of the way that you know we want to make sure that the stations and the railway integrate and serve the local communities um, that we're going to be passing through. Um, just to sort of close off um, before we go into Q&A, I just wanted to go through um, a couple of examples of work that we're currently doing on connection stage one, uh, which is uh, the Oxford to Bletchley Milton Keynes Route. And just to show you some of the progress that we've made over the last uh, couple of years, uh, some of you that live locally might be already be aware of some of these changes. So just by way of a bit of a context, as I mentioned earlier, um, this part of the project um, was effectively commissioned before EWR Co came into progress, in, into being, but uh, we're now working very closely with the Alliance team to support the delivery of this. Uh, and we're looking at um, a service of two passenger trains per hour 
from Oxford to Bletchley or Milton Keynes. And apologies for one second, just take a sip of water. So we're very much looking at how to use the existing railway alignment and also keeping commitment to maintaining the existing freight provision along that current route as well. And you can see from there that there's quite a lot of infrastructure work um, that needs to take place. And we also have quite a major interface with HS2 um, as well and the work that that's happening in the region there as well. Also, just to point out that we have a joint sponsorship team with Network Rail to help us deliver and who are accountable for the delivery of this particular connection stage. So I just want to introduce um, the first section, which is the 2A section in CS1. Um, so we have this um, new stretch of railway line, um, uh, Bista Fringe. Um, so for me, one of the novelties here is about delivery of material by rail, but actually about a, for the long term picture, moving um, the transportation of goods for the programme onto rail rather than HGV um, transportation. Um, um, for me, the work happening around Charbridge Lane is also quite important, particularly around the integration that we're having with Highways England to improve the capacity for road users as well. So for me, that's a very great example of the communication we have with other local stakeholders in the area as well to improve the overall customer experience, not just for the rail users, but also for um, road users as well. And um, just again to emphasise that actually um, our engagement with local stakeholders um, is equally important, um, particularly with respect to the uh, utility side as well. So we're having a lot of conversations with um, SSE and other utilities providers to make sure that the overall provision isn't disrupted. Um, the next section of work section is um, is uh, the cutting at Winslow. And in this picture, the new station will be on the right hand side of this picture and there'll be two platforms either side. Uh, they're roughly, I think, about 106 metres uh, long. Um, again, we're having a lot of work with Highways England with respect to remodelling some of the road junctions uh, and connections for local residents. We, we definitely do not want to be in a situation where we're cutting off local communities um, from each other and splitting them in half but just because of a new railway line. Um, and we're also working closely with the local government Government, government bodies as well to make sure that we're having appropriate provision both for the current population and the projected future growth um, of the population as well. Um, the 2C section of the route um, is where we connect in with the West Coast Main Line uh, and there's been some uh, interesting new civils works that's taking place. Um, I think, uh, I know that I've certainly seen uh, some time lapse videos of some of the work that's taking place in Geordie. I think I'm, I, I can't remember, but I think some of them might be available on YouTube as well to have a look at. Uh, but there's definitely some. Um, I know we've seen one of the Buckingham Road work, which has been quite interesting. Um, and local residents, I think, were able to have a look at that as well. Um, you know, we we very much, as part of this work and as for the wider route, we acknowledge and are looking to seek engagement with existing train operators and other railway users as well. So we want to make sure that we keep the conversation going um, with all the interested parties. Um, to me, it's all about that early engagement to make sure that um, delivery of the work can happen as smoothly as possible. So this is just a, a quick overview of the programme for the CS1 part of the programme. So we're looking at um, a provision, provisional date of 2025 for the CS1 services to uh, run between Oxford and Bletchley, Milton Keynes. Um, we do have a, we're looking at a programme for the overarching one. Like, I'm not sure that I can say anything about that too much, but this is this is the first part connection stage one. Uh, 
just again I'm conscious of time and I apologize I've I, I run over the, the half an hour that I'd allotted for myself to talk about this but just wanted to talk about CS2 and CS3 as well so the next couple of connection stages so some of you may be aware that we recently held a non-statutory consultation earlier this year um, we'd had a public consultation the previous year which, year, which was in person um, and we were hoping to do this in person as well but because of COVID restrictions we were quite successfully able to run this as a virtual uh, consult consultation you can see some of the statistics there with, with regards to the amount of engagement that we had for that. Um, a key part of that really uh, was around um, engaging with local landowners um, and la environmental stakeholders to make sure that we get the appropriate surveys carried out um, and to make sure that we're getting this information as early as possible in preparation for uh, some of the preliminary design um, for CS2 and CS3. In terms of the innovation side of things, our environmental team have done, um, and I apologies, this, this isn't a live thing, but you can see this on our website, I think, believe, but they've done created some interactive maps um, where we've been able to sort of plot um, key locations of interest with regards to um, environmental areas and are using that to help plan uh, some of our, our, our work at the moment. In terms of further information, um, uh, we've created um, an online community hub for uh, the local community and for members of the public to engage um, about East West Rail. We absolutely welcome um, all engagement uh, and if you're interested in having a look, um, the details are on there, communityhub.eastwestrail.co.uk. Uh, please do have a look um, and um, uh, you, you know, we welcome ideas uh, and thoughts um, and your further engagement through there as well. And so we have some polls and surveys and things that you can take as well. So in terms of the CS2, CS3, so the Bedford to Cambridge, uh, a piece of work, as I mentioned, we, we just completed the non-statutory, the second non-statutory public consultation. So we're currently at stage three, where we're looking at choosing the preferred route alignment, and we're working towards our statutory public consultation, which will be taking place next year. Uh, once we've held that, we'll be then looking to uh, work towards the developed consent order where we submit the application uh, which would then facilitate us allowing, allowing construction to start for that, that phase of the work. Um, so thank you very much for bearing with me. I, I've run slightly over the length, time length I wanted to go through but uh, we now have some time for, for Q&A so I'll just pop out of that because I can't see the chat bar um, so I'll just stop sharing. But um, well, OK, I will I will feed you the questions and we have a lot that have already come in. Um, so that's that's good in one way. Um, so first question, how many passengers are expected to arrive at the station on foot by bike in cars or by bus? And how can bikes and scooters best be accommodated on the trains? Absolutely. So um, I don't have the specific answer. To that question but I know that my colleagues have been looking at that um, and are certainly for CS1 have got some data together for um, planning that for the layouts of the station at CS1 and we're currently looking at that at the moment for CS2, CS3 to ident identify and understand what um, what the yeah, to understand the numbers uh, a, bit, a bit further and incorporate that into our designs. OK, are you planning for full accessibility for passengers with a disability? Absolutely, as much as we can. Uh, so we have uh, we have a, as part of our customer sort of service team, I have one of my colleagues who uh, who's specifically looking at accessibility and advising us on that. Um, I'll reword the are the trains all electric and what will the maximum speed be? Good question. I, I knew that one was going to come up, so yeah. I'll, 
<laughs> yes. So in terms of um, our, our fleet, um, we, Jordi, you'll have to remind me and I apologise. Um, I think we, I'm, I think our interim fleet um, are not electric, but we're, we're looking at options for our um, uh, interim and long term fleet in terms of moving towards um, being electrified. Uh, so we're, we're investigating all the best possible options in terms of accessibility. Yes, we have, we're hopefully looking at the layout to be accessible. Jordi, sorry I interrupted you there. <laughs> no, no, I just wanted to, to sort of add to your point that um, so in terms of the, the traction itself, so at the moment, uh, decision has not been made by the government. Um, one thing that sort of Tanya alluded to, but I'd like to be made clear is that East West Rail aims to become a net zero carbon railway. And on that basis, um, we're looking at a series of options, um, one of those being electrification, but not exclusively, so hydrogen. Potentially, that could also be an option uh, into you know how the the railway, uh, uh, sorry, the trains that run on the East West Rail um, are powered. Um, and obviously, one point to to highlight there is that the government has you know further committed to the removal of all diesel only trains by 2040. So, from that perspective, we're still we're working with the government, but we're still waiting for. A, final government decision on, on what the traction should be. Nonetheless, in terms of um, CS1 and 2, so um, uh, Oxford all the way to, to Milton Keynes, um, uh, we're looking at an interim solution uh, that of, of self-propelled trains of diesel um, uh, that, you know, for, that could deliver like a cost effective way of, of, you know, getting those services up and running as, as soon as possible. If if turns out that like self propel meaning diesel is, is the best way to get those um, up and running, but um, that also allows us kind of extra time as we explore these options for the long term fleet for when the whole line is is fully up and running, uh, while also allowing us to unlock the benefits of of having the new route um, functioning earlier. So it's a mixture of the of the two. Okay, thank you. Um, right, next question. Uh, the UK was recently ranked one of the worst countries in the world for biodiversity decline. How was the project net positive biodiversity determined? So um, I don't know the specific details of our environmental team. I think we can certainly find out and come back to you on that one. Um, but we are, are essentially, we're, we're looking to make a positive impact. So we are looking to, you know, Built, you know, at, at least maintain what's there and where we can to leave a positive impact. Thank you. Um, I know that the sketches show a link to Aylesbury. What is the status of this link? Is it part of the Oxford to Milton Keynes work? Sure, absolutely. Um, so we want to improve, we definitely want to improve local connectivity in the area. Um, I suppose, alluding to what my colleague Geordie said earlier, the important thing is we want to make sure that the service is reliable for the passengers. Um, so the original proposal didn't include a, a reliable service, so we need to invest a little bit more to make sure that the service from Aylesbury to Milton Keynes can actually run. So we're currently working with the government to uh, demonstrate that this is a value for money investment for the taxpayer so we can secure the appropriate authority to proceed on that. OK, the, the next question was about the type of trains, but I think that has already been answered. Um, and if the person who asked that question did have something else specific, maybe they could type it in because I'm going to jump over it. Um, will freight, uh, freight and passengers be separated or will be goods carried on the passenger trains, uh, e.g. for personal deliveries? Um, and what facility, sorry, that it's, it's multi, so you probably deal with this. Um, what facilities will there be on the trains for passengers? And I guess this is um, trolley service or buffet car. Um, will the trains have drivers, operators or be unmanned? Um, and will there be software to inform the user on carriage occupancy? In other words, where there are vacant seats? OK, right, I'll try and deal with those in order so <laughs> with respect to freight um we're aware that there is absolutely a desire to support freight um across the the new route 
our specific remit as East West Rail Company is to develop infrastructure for passenger services. Um, but, but we also have to make sure that the new railway line will support existing freight services. Um, it's a bit, I think for us, it's a bit too early to make any assumptions, um, particularly because for the new part of the railway, we don't know how much freight demand there would be. We currently have a study underway uh, to help us with that and no decisions have been made yet, but we'll, um, as more detailed information becomes available, we'll be able to share that. I think the, the, the aim is to share that at the statutory consultation. Um, with respect to a second facilities question. Facilities on board. Facilities on trains. So I think I'll, I'll refer back to sort of Geordie uh, on that one in the sense of we, we, you know, we, we are looking at options for our interim fleet and that's part of some of the work that my colleagues are doing which is look at the best layouts um, and um, engaging with customers to understand what services they would like on trains you know whether that, whether it's something at the station whether it's a trolley service or whatever it is so you know we're looking at that now and looking at how we can best deliver what the customer wants and so sorry what was the third part of the question um, software to inform the user on carriage occupancy in other words where are the vacant seats absolutely so again i'm very much aware of that as part of our customer concept uh, piece of work and that we are looking into you know the best ways to share that information with customers so that will be definitely part of our proposed solutions um i can't i i don't know what that looks like yet but we're, look, we're looking into it is what i'm saying what i can say okay and there was a further part to that question um will it be two or four track so the four track would allow for express services to bypass the stopping trains indeed um so i think the the layout for cs one is already predetermined in the sense of I think it's two track. With respect to CS2, CS3, we're still at the preliminary stage. And I think because of factors like, like the freight question, we're still looking into what the best options would be. So we'll have more information. We're working to have having a more detailed solution or proposal available at the statutory consultation. Okay, uh, the next was again on uh, whether it's electric. Uh, will the rolling stock be cascaded or new? Um, and if new, will it be an electric? But I mean, it, will it be a cascaded or new? Um, so I think we have to consider what's the best option for our interim fleet. Again, looking to what Geordie was saying earlier about how can we get the service quickly up and running in a reliable fashion for customers now? versus our plans for the longer term. Um, and I think, Geordie, it'd probably be fair to say it's, it will take the appropriate choice at the right point. Um, yeah. yeah. yeah okay. Fair. Sorry, Geordie. No, no, I, I was done. I was just um, emphasising uh, what Tanya just, just said. Okay. Um, are there plans to run trains from beyond Oxford or Cambridge along the route? In other words, um, is there a scope to, for instance, cross country to set up cross country services, I guess? Potentially. So one of the things that I'm looking at with my colleagues is um, a target state view uh, of the railway. Um, so at the moment, I suppose our day to day remit is the CS1, CS2, CS3. But as part of this target state of view, we are looking at the potential for other other future expansions. It, just to add one point there, though, and like that uh, to date, though the the remit that we have been given by the Secretary of State as a, as a company is is to deliver a reliable service between Oxford all the way up to Cambridge. Nonetheless, as Sunny alluded to, there's like wider um, kind of um uh works sort of taking place to or sorry not works but like sort of um studies but like to like our remedies is very specific in that sense between oxford and cambridge nonetheless if it if it was to change at some point um we would be happy to kind of like um uh, further expand as as the secretary of state uh, wished OK, thank you. Uh, right, the next one is very specific. Can you explain how the service will operate through Quainton Road, where there is a major rail museum site? No apparent plan to give any service here, possible impact of noise and disturbance to the museum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, 
that's fine. I I personally don't know the specific details to answer that question. Um, so um, could, I think could I suggest that is one where if the person who asked it could email me the question, I will pass it on, and you could possibly deal with that outside the meeting. That's absolutely fine. Um, okay, uh, do that, and there is. Um, well, there's, I think somebody has come back on um, uh, an earlier question. The, the idea of an interim solution of diesel trains seems very strange. The average life of a train is around 40 years. Uh, so isn't this totally inconsistent with climate objectives? Um, I know what you're going to say, <laughs> but <laughs> please say it. No, indeed. Um, so again, uh, alluding to what my colleague Jordi referred to earlier, I think we've got to remember that we we have a balancing act between um, waiting for new technologies to be available and decisions, uh, some of the decisions to be made, versus getting um, a service into place smoothly and quickly for our customer base. And so that's why I think we we have this thinking about an interim fleet versus the long term fleet. It's you know we we have to there's a bit of a balance between services now versus the long time gain. Would that be fair to say, Jordi? Yeah, no, I mean, and, and also to, to stress the point that like, in any case, that would only be for the interim fleet and that would be in service for a very specific amount of time. As, as mentioned earlier, the, the long term fleet um, might be powered, uh, you know, might have different types of traction. One of those is electric, like electric, but it could also be uh, very well, like, you know, hydrogen or, or battery or a combination of 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 the the like the three or two or um but nonetheless it's kind of referring back i suppose to kind of that goal of like being a, an interior carbon railway is very uh, uh, prevalent it's just that like the specific method of traction for the long term fleet has still not been um, decided by government but that that's the net zero carbon um objective is is very very much um there for both us and the government to to achieve. Um, there are strings of questions on really this, this same topic. Um, I, I think, um, can you confirm that um, the, the, the design of the, the bits that you're putting together will be capable of um, electrification, either as it's built or very easily, um, in other words, you won't have to sort of start rebuilding bridges um, subsequently. Yeah, I, I think it'd be fair to say that's part of all the work we're doing. We're looking, we're making sure that we've got provision for electrification. I think that's right, Geordie. Yeah. Um, uh, well, there is a question to say, can we organise a visit to a site? <laughs> Uh, a non-operational uh, bit uh, at some time in the future. I'm sure we will try and look at that uh, at an appropriate time. Absolutely, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, what is the overall cost difference between installing electrification for day one or retrofitting? Mm. So again, <laughs> it's one where I, I don't have the figures to hand for you, unfortunately, uh, but I um, I think you know it's within the general public remit that we know that there is a difference between the two um, in terms of specifically for East West Rail. I don't I don't have the figures. And I, and I just know that we're looking into it right now. Okay, that's the uh, the final one that is on the chat. Unless anyone is going to throw another one in quickly, um, we'll bring it to halt there. Uh, and I will thank uh, Tanya and Jordi. That was. Uh, really interesting uh, from the number of questions. You can see how much interest it's generated. If people do have uh, further questions, um, please email them to me. You you have my email address on the link that I sent out uh, and I will pass it them on um, so you can get a specific uh, answer. Um, um, I will now stop a recording. So I have stopped the recording.